Hi, Karen. Happy Galentine's week. Ooh, I love that. Happy Galentine's week to you, Katie. Thank you for once again agreeing to celebrate Galentine's Day with the one and only Ginger Buddha, aka Tori. Oh my God, what a good time. It was such a good time. Listeners, you were in for such a treat, truly. Like, I know we said this right before we hit record on this intro that like the last hour, it was, it felt like accelerated time to me. Like, I don't even, I feel like I entered a portal or something. Like, I don't even know how that was an hour long. Like, how was that even possible? Yeah, it was such a treat to talk to Tori. I mean, we don't call her Ginger, Bu- Ginger Buddha for nothing. Yeah. I mentioned that in this episode, Um, like legit, like she's incredible. Not for nothing is she Ginger Buddha. And I got to say, everybody, again, buckle up because we go in. I feel like the three of us together, like we are like, oh, my God, what was what did you say? OK, so that episode hasn't come out. We are scuba, not snorkelers. Yeah. Scuba divers, not snorkelers. Yeah, we are. We're scuba diving emotionally within the first minute, I would say about. Yeah, I think maybe maybe minute two. But yeah, it's really <laughs> Get yes. ready for, yeah, deep diving. Uh, like, but yes, also just it's this. We're not fucking around with this. No, no. Yeah, no shallow niceties. And I will also say I'm glad that we're doing an intro because I neglected to compliment Tori's sweatshirt while she was still with us, which I think was a gift from Barrett. And it says lady in the sheets, freak in the spreadsheets. And that shit is hilarious to me. That's and I'm so amazing. glad you wore it. I, I'm so glad that you pointed it out too, because I was trying to read it when we were talking, but I didn't get to catch the whole thing. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I would love to know where she got that sweatshirt. I think that's amazing. (laughs) But yeah, I'm so grateful that she took the time to chat with us and just to talk about friendship. I mean, this conversation is really deep and it really goes in a lot of different directions. And I think, I hope at least that everyone is going to get something out of this because yeah, friendship is a complicated thing. And I know we've touched on it, you know, in episodes past, but this one really gets into a lot of stuff that I don't think is just generally talked about, at least not openly. Absolutely. And I feel like, like I mentioned, I listened to our first Galentine's Day episode with Stranger Buddha. And this is the perfect part two to that. Like even a year later, this is the perfect companion piece to that conversation. I love that. I need to go back and listen. I haven't listened in a while. Yeah. So if you're wanting a companion experience, just stop right now and go back to and listen to 2022. And then you can just come back to us. Yes. I believe it is is episode 75. Nice. Yes. Galentine's Day, the first Galentine's Day. Stop, go listen, and then come back. Absolutely. And also, thank you, Tori. Thank you for coming on for this annual, now annual tradition it's just so awesome so we hope everyone enjoys it happy galentines hello and welcome ginger buddha to our galentines day annual event we're so happy you're here it wouldn't be galentines day without you i'm so happy to be here thank you for having me oh my gosh What what a fun annual thing to do well and you know you're We're excited to have you back, not only because we loved last year's episode, but because we are crass ratings chasers and you were our top episode of last year. So like by a lot. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. Well, great. We'll bring it on again. Yes. Ratings chasers. I'm here for it. (laughs) I wonder why that is just I'm very popular. I have a lot of friends care what I think. I mean, no, yes, <laughs> you're very influential and yes, I am people yes. all in my other life. I am actually an influencer. You may know me from such websites as Instagram. <laughs> yes. And TikTok. <laughs> and, t- and the TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> and the TikTok. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> so Tori, you came up with this amazing idea about friendship love languages. And I love this so much, but to recap, like I cover, like to kind of go back, I don't know if everyone who's listening, I mean, they might, everyone might know what love languages are, but if they don't, we should probably kind of go over them a little bit. Are you are you a pro at this, Tori? No, 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 okay. no. And it's actually on my mind and was at the front of my mind when Karen and I were talking because of how little I know about them and how well to talk about them with others. So 
I'm excited we're doing this this way today. Okay. Awesome. Well, I love this. And I, I mean, I have the love languages book on my bookshelf, but I have many of those types of books on my bookshelf. And I always think they're just going to like see through, through osmosis and they never do. And I, so I have a general idea of what love languages are. Karen, are you familiar with them? I, I can go through, I think. I, I am vaguely. Yes. I feel like I, I have definitely read that book. I have taken the quiz relatively recently. So it's this notion and Gary Chapman, I think is the author's name. I don't know if he's a psychologist. He wrote this book about love languages and said that there are five of them. And I don't know, Katie, do you want to, I feel like Katie, you and I have the same top two. Oh, really? Do we? I yes. love this. I love that you have read it and taken the test. Karen, you are absolutely the resident ex expert. Okay. I'll take a couple. And then do you want to take a couple? Yes. Okay. So quality time is one of them, which kind of self-explanatory. Basically the idea I think is that this is how you show people you love them. So it's like, and this is how you want to show others to show you that. Hmm? Okay. Words. Um, <laughs> this is how you want others to show you that they love you as well. And so quality time is definitely my love language. Um, and so spending quality time with people, um, attention, like I, for me, like when I am at a restaurant and someone is on their phone, it is truly like it's like a personal affront to me. Like it's so hard for me. And I don't know, like I know a lot of people who don't actually care if someone is like on their phone. It doesn't matter. But for me, it's like that you're not actually here for the quality time. So that's one. Words of affirmation is another. So it's like you could just blow someone off and, you know, never give them anything or never spend any time with them. But if you're saying I love you all the time or that you're beautiful and you're incredible, then they might be okay with it. Also, that's not mine. <laughs> Take it away, Karen. <laughs> oh my gosh. The other thing I will say about words of affirmation. So forgive me. I've read a lot of these ridiculous books. I just read the love prescription by Dr. Gottman and his oh, yeah. wife. I think we talked about it, right? And they're one of their things is like there are only, there are two words that are the key to any relationship, and it's thank you. So I think words of affirmation is also about like really expressing gratitude for even the most mundane things because otherwise you end up taking each other for granted all the time, and it's a thing. Um, gifts, I think, is another one that's pretty self explanatory. All right. Tori, I'm going to give you the last two. Um, I'm going to echo that I think words of affirmation for me sort of is communication in general. I know that's kind of cheating a little bit, but words of affirmation of the attention to the details is, is important. Um, and physical touch, um, <clears throat> excuse me for me. But also it's funny that Katie, you said at the beginning, the giving and receiving part. And when I said, I'm not actually familiar and that's why it's at the front of my mind is because I think the love languages that I receive are very different than the love languages I speak. Um, and that I think is the thing that I'm start I have now started to figure out in a lot of my relationships, which is why I'm thinking about it so much more, which is why it came up and sort of the idea of being like, I want this, but I don't, like I, I, for instance, I love to perform acts of service for others. I would love to do things. I would love to make you happy. I would love to do, you know, things, things, things. I am horrendously uncomfortable when people do things for me. Oh, like, interesting. It, so it's, it's, I think that that's why I sort of said I'm not an expert in it because I, I, I think these, they are five so specific, you know, they're things that can mean what they mean to you. But I also think that they're for me, because whatever, it's my life. I just say what I want. There's like gray ones sort of in the middle a little bit to sort of make them mean, I don't know. I'm not really saying this very clearly, but it's just, I think it's different and it changes. It's changed in my life as I've gotten older too, which I think has rocked some of my friendships, changed through COVID. It's what we sort of prioritize. Yeah, totally. It's also really interesting because I I don't actually, you might be totally right, Tori, that like you can have a different thing that you give and then a different thing that you want to receive. And it also could be different based on different relationships. It's like mm -hmm. parental mm -hmm. relationships versus like the friend that you met at Starbucks that you really hit it off with. It's like versus, you know, your longtime partner versus whatever. It's like there's, yeah, it's very, it's like 
very interesting. Which brings us to this friendship love language part. I realized when identifying love languages, my love language with my friends is not physical touch. Like I don't, that's, I don't get affirmation from my friendships by way of physical touch, the way I, I get affirmation in a, in a more intimate relationship that way. Yeah. So realizing, you know, what I need from my friendships is just very different. And I, I don't actually necessarily know what my friendship love languages are. That's sort of what Karen and I were talking about earlier, which brought us to this, this conversation. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. Well, and not knowing them means that you can't communicate them, right? Like, I think it's, Mm -hmm. it's realizing that you, as our friendships evolve and as we all get older, depth becomes more important. I think we have all shed friendships that were more shallow and Mm -hmm. you want this depth and this intimacy and that you get that through knowing some of these things and that it's not a natural conversation to have with your friends. So I'm very proud to say and to share as I've sort of started on this love language journey, it wasn't referenced this way with love languages, but I'm going to sort of take a bit of an off ramp, but I will loop this back around to the point where that you said, Karen, about not knowing how to ask for them and shoot, you said something else and I lost it. Um, Oh, um, deeper friendships, deeper friendships, because one of the things that I've recognized is as you get older and as your friends get older, bigger shit starts to go down. We're talking parents, we're talking long relationships, we're talking long lists of some deep, heavy shit. And so watching people that we've now had these long friendships with go through these really serious things. So fast forward to, I was with a very dear group of friends of mine that we've been friends for over a decade of, you know, with husbands and partners and, and stuff, there's this group of of us that get together every every year all the time. We started to go through some stuff and one of the members of the group reached out to me as sort of this, you know, we, we communicated in very much the same way. And this person asked me to sort of say, if it comes up, could you naturally say to, to our group of friends, you know, maybe we bring up the conversation about how to support each other. During this like hilarious white elephant secret Santa exchange, I dropped this bomb of like, Hey guys, awesome. So I'm just thinking that like now as we start to go through these really heavy things, we need to figure out a way to to know what the other needs in these moments. And it was this opening to this great conversation, but I dropped it at this incredibly awkward, weird time, but it needed to get out there and people started to think about it. The boys, of course, all thought something was wrong. Apparently on the walk home, all of them were like, what's up with Tori? What's going on? (laughs) What does she need to talk about? What's happening? But the, 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 the other friends and I have, have chatted about it since and been like, you know, this was really, you know, what do I need? I'm the person that's going to want to be all business. I don't, I don't want, I don't want a lot of fussy. I don't want a lot of how you doing. No, 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 no. If y'all need to cry, you can do that over there for a little bit. I'm going to need to do this before I can do this other thing and setting those boundaries and stuff is something we're we just have started this conversation to do and I think it's really awesome I mean I think it's really awesome that you had the courage Tori to say that in a group that doesn't normally talk like that like that's what an colossal gift seriously to have (laughs) to say that I'm like not even kidding like if I had anyone say that to me I would be like Like I have a few friends that ask me, like, how can I support you? If I tell them something that is hard or whatever's going on, they they say, how can I support you? And it's like, that is kind of a love language conversation of like, what Mm -hmm. do you need right now? Like kind of what do you, what would be helpful to you? But I love that you actually brought this up. How did it feel to actually say that in that moment? Were you nervous? Did you feel excited? What was it? Yeah, I will, excuse me. I do want to give this group of friends credit. I mean, we've been friends I mean, if any of them are listening to it, they're going to know who they are. This is, you know, but it, um, the, the group of women is very, very, very tight. And the group of dudes is tight, you know, have become over the year. And this is like a now a 15, 16, 17 year friendship. So I want to give them a lot of credit. One of them is a therapist. All of them are in therapy of some kind or have a relationship with a bigger being of some, you know, so it wasn't that out of the blue for me to bring a conversation like this to the table. I think they're used to me 
speak we speak in very you know a therapy I did this today and stuff like this so like generally it was a it was a safe space to say something like this um but I was nervous just because sometimes I feel like I'm the person that brings up therapy all the time and they may just be like you know yeah yeah okay Tori yeah we'll all communicate great mm -hmm, sure but I brought it up with a couple of the girls ahead of time and we'd been sort of throwing this idea around because of stuff with parents and you know we're dealing with dangerous things and scarier doctor's appointments and like some real stuff and it's time to talk about it and I'm so yeah, I guess I guess I hadn't really thought about how I felt about it, Katie. I guess a little nervous, um, but also something I've become really passionate about as the the person who's had in this in my particular friendship circles the oldest parent or the parent that's gone through the most toward the end of a life, um, yeah. and so. I'm very much about let's have the conversations, let's talk about the shit, let's do this stuff because it's so miserable if you don't. Yep. And so I guess I've gotten braver at those conversations. That's um, awesome. But thank you for asking. I never really thought about how I asked or how I felt doing it, but um felt good once I was done because everyone was open to it. They were weirded out at first. Um, I think they thought I was gonna drop a bomb, but it was it was great. It was received well. That's amazing. Well, and I love what you're saying. I mean, I love it and I hate it. What you're saying about as we get older, the stakes get higher. When you're mm -hmm. in your 20s, unless you all go through a traumatic event together, which hopefully you don't, the worst thing you go through is like uh, you break your breakups or mm -hmm. getting a bad grade on an exam, not getting into the grad school you wanted. Mm -hmm. And as we get older, like you're saying, it's deaths in the family, illness in the family, aging relatives, all of these things, divorce. Yeah. Yep. custody battles, all of this shit. And the yep. stakes just get higher and higher. And the, I'm just going to pop over with some champagne and we're going to cry it out. is not, that's not how we deal with these things. Like you, you have to adjust, you have to tailor the reaction. Yes. A hundred percent. And I think <clears throat> that that's one of the reasons too, why it's this coming back to this love language conversation is even if we don't frame it around these five particular things, being able to communicate to my best girlfriends or at least one of them who can run point for everybody else and say, I can't do emotional crying, sit on my bed and pour into everything and be sad about this right now. I need to call this person, close this, do this, do this, do this. Now, I know one of the other people in the group that we're talking about will not be like that and will need the swoop in of support of everybody descending and doing this. But how can we know that if we don't chat about it and we want to be helpful? Is it showing up with groceries? Like being practical about this, it doesn't feel cute and squishy and like, you know, coming over and popping champagne about it, but like figuring out childcare after a divorce or the loss of a this and like the idea of life moving forward after this thing has happened is the kind of shit we're talking about at this age. And it's shitty. It's hard. It's awful. But having gone through some stuff where we hadn't had those conversations, if you can have them just have like, I don't know. I feel like I'm getting yeah. deep and a little, the rage is back. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I, I, just, yes. I love you bringing this up so much Tori about like how, as you get older, it's just, it's like the stuff is more serious. The, it, it makes me think of like, I know I go crazy with my metaphors, but like, I think I lived in San Francisco for too long, but I keep thinking of like the stakes in a house. Like, so I used to live on a hill in the Bay Area and those stakes need to be more sturdy. Like they need to be able to hold more weight. Like you basically need to get, if you don't have stakes that are, you know, strong enough, you need to retrofit your shit. Like you need to retrofit your house. And it's like, that's the thing. It's like, I remember when I lived in San Francisco, I lived in Russian Hill in this like tiny apartment in this like crappy, crappy building that was built in the seventies. And it's like very common in this area where all of the, 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 um, the walls are so thin, like so thin, in fact, that I could hear the vibration of the phones in the, in the, the, the vibrating of the phone, not, not even like a ringing oh anyway. And so of the people like the next hotel door, room with your mom, yes, exactly. Oh, it's with so much like <laughs> ass slapping in the hotel room with my mom. So much like that. 
And so the thing is, is that maybe like four years into living there for five years, they retrofitted this building. And the way that happened was it was actually really painful for everyone involved because they had to dig an actual trench that was six feet um, deep around the entire building. So that we're talking about like digging through cement. They had to do, you know, it's jackhammering, it's all this stuff. And then they had to basically build a brace that would go under the cement and then build cement on top of it. The whole point is it's hard and it's like important to have an, a very, I'm trying, I'm really trying with this metaphor but like basically Land the plane. you're almost there i see yes. where you're going keep going it's like it's like <laughs> you need you need people who are willing to carry heavy shit like it's like th- these are pe- and it's and i also think that it's people who are also boundaried enough or at least like owning their stuff enough to know hey i'm not here to carry that right now or it's okay to be like you just said like the person who wants to sit on their bed and you know do emotional you know crying versus the person who wants to get shit done and like it, maybe that will that person will want to cry later it just i don't know i just think it's like i think that when i was younger i just didn't have the emotional maturity to know what i needed in friendships and I just, I just didn't like, how do you, you, my, you know, prefrontal cortex wasn't fully baked. And so it's like, I chose friends that, you know, were great in a lot of ways, but like, I'm not sure if they're retrofit friends and that's really harsh for me to say. And it's like, I don't always feel the same about all of my friends from a long time ago, but I think that there's such a beauty in just being honest. Like I have this friend right now that this is I'm kind of jumping a little bit, but like I'm going to Los Angeles in a couple of weeks and I have a very close friend named Brian who lives down there with his husband, Joey. And we always, my Tyler and I always go down and stay with them. And it's great. They're wonderful humans. And one of them is going through a rough patch at the moment. And I told one of them, I said, Hey, you know, we're going to come down, like no pressure. We don't need to stay with you if you don't want us to, like, it's no problem. But usually it would be like a guarantee that we would stay with them. And Brian was like, I have to get back to you. And then he like, he messaged me this whole um, manifesto about liberated relationships, which is oh. actually like, it's a, I'll, I'll link it in the description of the podcast, but it's a, by Adrian Marie Brown, who is this incredible mm-hmm. social justice, av- you know, like um, educator. And it's all about like, basically, you know, kind of shifting from, you know, codependent relationships where like, you're not really telling everyone what you really need to like, really liberated places of like this is what I need this is what doesn't work for me this is the communication style I want this is what you know like and just showing up in a different way like radical honesty in that way am I just rambling here I don't know if this is making sense it totally makes sense so yeah. okay so he sent it to you yes oh sorry I didn't, wait I, didn't say... I, I didn't actually conclude that story thank you karen um so he basically sent it to me we're hovering the runway we're hovering the runway here we go we're doing a lot of hovering (laughs) like he sent it to me in a way to say like hey it actually doesn't work right now for us to host you we would love to see you also we're not even sure if we can see you like it's great that you're coming down but like there's a lot going on right now and let's make a dinner reservation and if we show up great and if we don't like we love you and it's like i felt so liberate I mean liberated honestly I felt so happy I really really did I was like you know what that's amazing I'm gonna get an Airbnb that is like not too far from you so if you want to pop over great if you don't legit that's fine also it helps that I had COVID last year and when I had COVID they were supposed to stay with us for that week that like the first week of my COVID and they ended up coming to Oregon and not seeing us at all because I was so fucking sick and they didn't make a big deal out of it at all and we were able to tell them that we couldn't entertain or even see them and it's just like, oh my God, that level of honesty, like I don't have that with everyone. And I just want to say that the longer game of that is when you ask again and he says, yes, you'll know it's real. Yes. The yes. honesty and safety that the no creates in that relationship is so major. And I think it is wildly underappreciated that if someone says, hey, can I do X, Y, Z thing? And I say, you know what? It's actually no. I did it today with a dog sitting thing. I'm sitting like every dog through, through February. And it's awesome. And I got asked for this one day thing. And I was like, actually, you know what? No, I, I no, I can't do it. I, I have a lot of other things going on. And they were like, great. Awesome. No problem. We'll just, you know, we'll stick with this other plan. And it felt good to know I could say it so that I can say it in the future and it not be 
personal and an attack and a this, 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 all super valid. But this whole idea of I'm responsible for my reaction to your boundary plays here too, right? Like, yes. no, it's not a good time. Okay, cool. Not, oh, they didn't let me say how they've inconvenienced me and how this, this, this. It's empathizing with the other person. It's, you know, thinking empathy. It's a wild, wild concept, but that is a major part at play here, I think. And I think, ooh, I love this conversation. I think, I will just speak for myself, I guess. But I suspect the friendships or the relationships that have fallen away are the people who would have a hissy fit for a, I really just can't right now. Oh my God, I can't believe you can't, right? Like the people in my life who cannot hear no, who have absolutely no curiosity about what's like actually going on with me, who don't actually see me. Those are the people that I'm like not cool with right now. Like those are the people who I have not made a big effort to reconnect with because it's like, ah, my interactions with you, I realize now we're so fraught and we're not, there was no grace and we're kind of shitty and I'm not that person anymore. Didn't give you any spoons. (laughs) That's right. You know how I was into the spoons. Yeah, I mean, I think that COVID... The spoons. You may know this. Karen, do you know it better than I do by name? Please be my guest. Oh, I just know the whole spoony thing. What's spoony? I don't know. Basically, the the idea is that throughout your day, whoever there's going to be listeners out there that are just like punching their tables thinking this is not the right way to say it. But basically, the deal is, is when you start each day, you start and you are you have a certain amount of spoons i don't know why it's spoons what why the 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 purpose of the actual item but things that you do that expel energy cost you a certain amount of spoons and certain other things that you do help you to collect spoons and the spoons i believe are energy or joy or or just sort of this this thing that and if you think about it as more of a transactional thing and who takes your spoons who brings you spoons like how how does that sort of measure out it sort of helps you understand who's draining your energy what's being brought back to your life like there was one when I had first heard about this we got offered tickets to to a concert and there was like it was it was like a Sunday night it was was it Lizzo Lizzo it was Lizzo it was Lizzo it was Sunday night it was like rainy and cold I just hosted this like whole thing all weekend and I was like you know how many spoons I will get for going to Lizzo with Karen? Are you kidding me? That's what you do. That's what you do. So I feel like drawing that back to the the thing you're saying, Karen, about the ones that have fallen away are the ones that just are too many spoons. You take too many spoons without dropping any more back in. Yes. That harsh yes. maybe that is. I uh, think that is my truth. I love this so much. And I also wonder how many spoons I start the day with some some days I start the day with like just the tip of a spoon (laughs) and I and then some days I have like 50 and it's like wow if I slept really well or I'm eating right or I'm exercising whatever it's like but it's so important energy is so important in this way and it's like this is it's like you're talking it seems like you're talking about life force energy it's like if I mean I When I went back to San Francisco the very first time, I basically gave away all of my spoons to every single person that I had ever known in San Francisco. And I ended up giving all of them really to one group of people. And that was like the first night. And then the rest of the time I was there, I was like, I don't even know where to get more spoons. How do I get spoons? Do I meditate and they come about? Like, where do I get them? And then it's like, you feel bankrupt of yeah it's really important actually to pay attention to this stuff it's so critical for health and well-being and it's funny you say the thing about you know sometimes you start the morning with half a spoon (laughs) or a tip of a spoon anyone who lives in Chicago or or you know I'm sure it's similar in Bend I'm not sure but we're going on like day 704 of gray cloudy gloomy just it's hard to start the day with a lot of spoons when it's just been like evening for fucking seven weeks like it's just it's so gray 
it's salty. But I started to think of ways that I could for my days to start better. And it was for me, clean up the kitchen, load the dishwasher, make sure I'm waking up to a clean kitchen. That's a huge thing for me. It's not everybody's jam, but it's a huge thing. Going to bed in a made bed. I make my bed every day. This is just part of my jam. So setting myself up for more success, you know, doing this and just so it's not going to be something that's going to piss me off, like scrubbing that dirty dish from last night and getting dishwater on my pajamas or whatever the hell it is. Um, but just thinking about it in terms of actual exchange of an item for this is, is kind of, it's kind of crazy how, how it reframes who gets what. I talked about it with one of my staff, um, about like Christmas, Christmas plans, Christmas travel. I didn't think I wasn't think, referencing it in spoons at the time, but who got what time from them and who drove where and how did they meet in the middle and who did they see for the longest? And it was very, very, very stressful. And so the conversation when they got back was, well, did you enjoy any of that? Like you gave all of your everything to everybody else, but did you have a Merry Christmas or did you have a big old shitball Christmas? driving around and riding the Amtrak. Oh man. There's so much there. And so much. the obligation, I feel like what comes up for me about the holidays, especially, and Katie, I don't know how much you want to get into your Christmas drama. I don't know how much we talked about it on the pod, but I feel like that that is the other element of when you don't have conversations with your friends about what you need, societal the societal expectations fill in the gap and Tori you and I talked about this earlier or you make assumptions about what someone needs mm -hmm. and you give them the thing you've decided that they need without actually asking them yep and you're both resentful because that person didn't get what they needed and you feel like well you're an ingrate I did this thing for you that you need and how much just open conversation would solve so much of that. But yes, I just think of this notion of, well, we're friends and I don't know what you need. So I'm obligated to do this thing for you because we are friends. When really, maybe that's not what you fucking want. Uh-huh. Totally. Oh yeah. Yep. That's major. And I think that that, that comes up for me uh, a lot. I have found this is, this is a vulnerable thing to admit <laughs> here, but this comes up for me. I've realized a lot with my friends and relationships. Um, as I look, you know, as I'm single and dating and, and, you know, relationship hunting as it were, um, I, for a while was sort of taking it as a personal affront when others were my relationships and was trying to project my shit onto them. And, you know, things came up and I was really lucky that I have a really good friend who called me on that shit. It was awkward and hard and awful and very weird for a little bit, but worth it. And it was actually that conversation that made me realize I was projecting all of this on other things. I didn't even realize I was doing it and helped me deal with all this other stuff. So again, I mean, to me, that sort of a words of affirmation or the communication piece of, I now know that this friend and I can get through another tough conversation. Still be weird, still is gonna be awkward, but the friendship won't be lost if I'm honest with this person, because it's worth it. The friendship was worth it. Um, but it's it's hard. It's hard to be, I mean, to have good friendships, to have good relationships of any kind, you have to be aware of your shit. I mean, we're talking about some high level communication stuff, assuming some other work has been done. I think we should call that out too that yes. like this isn't not everybody can do this and I would also say I feel like I should call out three you know people with without human children you know ourselves with time with friendship that's a little different than than a lot of other women have the opportunity to nurture friendships I think it's important to call out that we do have I will speak for myself I suppose more time to nurture friendships than I think some others do so I that's an honesty piece as well. But yeah, this is some this is some top level communication. I well, I wish totally. it were basic. I, think. I wish it was I wish it were basic too. And I find that like if I try to have these conversations with people that don't do their own work, it like is just 
it's like a vacuum like it just like oh okay like it's a, like a rubber band effect of like oh got it okay i i will go not that not to say that i'm some enlightened buddha i'm not at all god damn but at the same time it's like i would prefer to have those hard conversations with people who have already looked at their own shit and that don't think that they are god's gift or that like it's just it's really hard i think that like for people who are listening, thinking like this would be so amazing to have a friendship that was so deep that, you know, I could tell someone how I felt or that I was frustrated with them or anything. I just wonder like what I can give them to take away with to say like, this is how you could reframe it. Or like, I don't know. I've like, yeah, Tori, please. Like, I just I was just... going to ask a question. I was actually going to ask you before you brought up the, how can we have the listeners take something away? When do you think you became the person or how do you think, and I pitch this to both of you, um, you became the person that wasn't scared of an honest conversation with your friends. Cause I, I gotta say, as I'm hearing this reflected back to me, I don't know that it was necessarily COVID that did this. There was certainly a safety that came from being able to set clear boundaries then that made it easier, but I have not always been the person that could sit down and be like, you know what? that really hurt my feelings. And I think we'd like to talk about it. Absolutely not. Like that's, this is kind of pretty new for me, I would say. Do you guys know when it happened or when would you be able to identify that or how you do? I, I think what comes up for me is having employees, having employees and having them go through <gasps> some shit, some shit that, was unavoidable. I think in friendships, you can kind of like, you know, you can kind of duck around some stuff and like not have the conversation or like figure out all these ways to avoid it. We're at work and I pay you to show up every day and you fucking didn't show up. And now we have to have a conversation about that. Right? That like, is when it happened. That is when it happened. Like it is now wow. my job to have this, com now it's my job to have this conversation with you that I don't want to fucking have. Bitch, why didn't you come in? No call, no show, what's wrong with you? But now, <laughs> I, like, I, I have to now have this conversation with you. And for me, that's what, that's what comes up when I think about, like, how I got to this place because I was a giant avoider. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to have hard conversations with people. Like, I'm the hard conversation haver in my family, but I'm the youngest and it's easier. But I feel like, in life in general, that's what has done it is managing people. I haven't gotten there yet. Like that's the, I'm sweating right now because like <laughs> I, I am really, I'm like legitimately sweating because I am the hard conversation person with my family, but I am not the hard conversation person with my friends. And I had a situation a couple of years back where a close friend of mine confronted me about something. And I was like, oh. like, and I have had like 30 years of therapy. And I was like, what do you mean? And she's like, this is what I, she was mad at me about something. And I was like, okay, well, I'm glad that you're confronting me about this. And it ended up being better. We, it ended up being that we could actually be closer. Um, but you two, I'm not even joking. Like I talk a big game. I'm not that person yet. I want to be, I'm in a few situations right now where I'm being tested. Like the universe is like, Hey, this is a really good example of how you could put a boundary. And it's not that I don't tell my friends what I need when I know that I'm already safe. I think that the challenge is when I don't know if I'm safe or not, that I can then speak up for myself. I, if I don't know that I'm safe, it's very hard for me to speak up for myself. I hear you a hundred percent. And I would answer to you what I got from my therapist. I'll save you a sesh and say, Thank you. you're welcome. Talk yourself through what unsafe looks like. Mm. Because oftentimes we use the term unsafe, like, I feel unsafe when speaking to certain people, but the unsafe I feel about confronting a friend about something is what if she is mad at me about something back? Or what if we have to talk about something? Or what if I really hurt her feelings? And that's ultimately where it comes from for a lot of people. So if your unsafe feeling is I'm going to hurt her feelings, 
you can remind yourself, I'm not a cruel person. Yeah. I'm not going to, I, I'm, her feelings may be hurt by what I need to tell her, but you're not going to be mean. And if the unsafe part is that this person is going to hurt you in some way, then you know what armor to bring. It's either a, your purse is on your lap and your keys are in your hand and you get up and walk out, whether you bring someone with you. So like drawing what the unsafe means for me has really helped me because I'm very much a worst case scenario person. So starting there and working backwards for me sometimes helps bring some reality to it of like, the worst thing that happens is that they disagree. This comes up for me a lot at work. It's like people, people be trying to tell me all sorts of shit all the time. And I'm, I got receipts. I got timestamps. I got emails. Bitch, I'm sorry. People, people's voicemails don't vanish anymore. That was something <laughs> we could, can't use that out anymore. Um, but it's just, it's a, uh, okay, well, I understand this is how you feel, but this is, this is where we are. Yeah. And walk it back, you know, like the, the worst, the worst case scenario may feel unsafe as you think about it, but it might not be in reality and just touch base with it a little bit. So that. Thank you. I mean, honestly, thank you. You're not ginger Buddha for nothing. Like this is like <gasps> so helpful, honestly, because like that's that it's so helpful because unsafe is the wrong word. I'm not saying that I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to like gas emotionally myself. safe is I understand if that's what you're saying. Totally, maybe. totally. But I think it's also like it's really anchoring myself in my own truth and giving that credence and giving that like the weight it deserves like to to actually say how I really feel matters and yeah I think that I am you know the people pleasing runs deep the codependency runs deep and it's like if I just want everyone to like me all the time then I'm gonna stay in a state of anguish if I'm not saying what I really feel you know Katie I can't remember I'm gonna ref- I'm going to say something that you said to me, and I apologize because I can't remember if you've said it on the pod or off the pod, but it's not like it's along what you just said. You said something to me once about not betraying yourself for someone else, for someone else's comfort, like not like betraying inner Katie who didn't want to fucking do the thing, not betraying that person and doing the thing for, for this other person. And I feel like I wonder if that applies to these hard conversations, these hard situations. Like, are you betraying yourself on behalf of these other people? I mean, a hundred percent. Thank you for bringing that up, Karen. Cause it's like, yeah. I mean, I think that really what I'm doing is just trying to protect them and Mm. in, and which is a, a fallacy. Like, I don't even know what that means and I don't know what their personal experience is. And so all I know is my own personal experience and I have to just be willing to maybe take a shot and then do it (laughs) because it's like, it's hard. It's really hard. Not joking about it, but really. I might also throw in, if I could just bring this full circle for a moment and say, it sounds to me, I don't, I don't know the situations that you're speaking of specifically, but it sounds to me like it might be costing you more spoons stressing about it than it would cost you to have the brutal conversation. Yeah. And that's absolutely true. Yeah. I've gone through multiple, um, you know, what is it? Spoon drawers on this. <laughs> so, mm. yeah. I mean, to a friend, have you talked to a friend about the conversation that isn't involved in the conversation? Like practiced it? No, but that's a good idea. That's I don't think really, that's really off the table. Idea. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Someone who's super safe about, again, emotionally safe. Um mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just interesting. And hearing the way you're going to deliver it, because it might just be heard a little differently than you intended. And it's like a a practice run. And also, Katie, I think it's really important to realize that even on this podcast, all the spoon drawers you've gone through thinking about this is coming from a place of kindness and not wanting them to be hurt or to cause anguish. Totally. And that in of itself makes you a kind human, I think. Thanks. Thanks. You're Thanks welcome. you too. I really appreciate you talking me through this. You've, sa- okay. you've kind of saved me like five therapy sessions. I'm not actually kidding. I <laughs> here for it. I genuinely just got off the phone with my therapist about this. So yeah, it's very helpful. Um, okay, wait, but we should go back to the questions that we put down because they're so, so good. Um, the hallmarks of your longest friendships. I would love to know 
for the two of you. The longest I I was thinking the hallmark. What are the hallmarks of your most <laughs> nourishing friendships? Because for me, some of my longer longest friendships are not my most nourishing friendships. So it's like the ones that I love the most. First thing I was gonna say was willingness to attend a costume party <laughs> <laughs> or a themed party. I'm serious. That's a really big hallmark. Really, willingness to commit to a costume is like serious business around here i love this Um, also tori i heard that you had a gorgeous cobalt blue jumpsuit at the fancy dress party which what uh, i need a photo that sounds incredible um, i am a winter i am a jewel tone i am a jewel tone baby Mm -hmm. yes thank you it was it was it was incredible tj maxx for the win it was Uh, amazing tj maxx that's awesome i'm a (laughs) maxinista not sponsored but we're open our dms are open but could be. Mm-hmm. Yes. I didn't. Yeah. Um, let me think about that. I think we talked about this. So I, it's really funny. I listened to our first Valentine's Day episode right before this, but I didn't have enough time. So I listened to it at like two times speed. And we all said, I'm like, mine's like this. And it's really funny, actually. <laughs> um, and we did talk about this a little bit. And part of it was this idea that you can pick up where you left off no matter how much time has gone by. I think that is definitely a hallmark. Like I, my oldest friend, the person I have been friends with the longest in my life, Sarah lives in Washington state, not Oregon. Sarah lives in Washington. And I've been friends with Sarah since I was 11 or 12 years old. Wow. And we just text each other randomly uh, completely out of the blue. Sometimes we call on each other's birthdays, but like, I feel like I will always be friends with her. And I think she actually listens to this podcast, which I didn't know. Hi, Sarah. I love you. So yeah, I just think it's that it's that is definitely one of them for me. Which to me sounds like, cause I was going to say something similar, but I was going to say sort of doesn't expect to be caught up on all of the stuff. Yep. Like I love that knows that, which I think is similar. I, I have a lot of long time friends as well and I, we can go sometimes weeks sometimes months sometimes we talked about this in relation to camp friendships I think of we would go like 10 months and then show back up I mean it's yeah I think just safety in the friendship is is the hallmark just being able to show up however I happen to be that day yeah I love that I think for me it's like celebrating each other like being genuine. in a costume at a costume party yes <laughs> Like being genuinely happy for one another. Like there's no competition. There's no, it's just, you're genuinely happy for the other person's happiness. I think that's helpful also. I think, and this is also something I will admit from the Gottman book is the idea in a couple, and it's true of any relationship, admiration. Like when you, like the way that I talk about you guys to people who don't know you, Sometimes I wish you could hear it because you'd be like, damn, I am that bitch. Like I just, the way that I like just talk you guys up and just like, you're the most amazing people and oh my God, all of these things. Like, I think that that is also a hallmark. Like you like legitimately admire each other and who you are. I love that. I love that. Yes. I would say almost every single person in my life knows who you are, Karen. Karen. No. knows that you are an absolute <laughs> goddess like that's oh. like I mean it's true it's true if you we could just record those conversations I also want to jump in here and say um because there might be some people listening out there that are in a transition in their life and don't find themselves with the friendships that we might be mentioning here I know a lot of young moms or just people that have moved or relocated or stuff it's hard to make friends as an adult um and I just want to say to all of us that have the friends or you know if there's someone new friendship can come up at other you know all sorts of points and it doesn't we're not it doesn't all have to be this like rooted in our feminine goddess goodness of being a good friend to everybody <laughs> like you can have it can be and that's fucking great and I love it however you know making friends at work and having good work friends which is in a foundation of as honest as you want to be there like I think sometimes we forget we're, you know, we speak in generalizations and I have such intense friendships with people that I, you know, sometimes and I forget that, you know, 
friendship can can look different ways and you know if you're new to a space and like figuring out who you want as your friends that's that's okay too Mm -hmm. I totally I so appreciate that Tori and I appreciate like the idea that friendships can just look different like in different phases of your life and different ask like different areas of your life like you say like the work friend who is just I have a few work friends that are just nice to have like shooting the shit conversation we don't have Mm -hmm. any like they don't know anything about my life and it's actually really great it's like oh okay I don't have to go into anything with this person yeah it's not that deep and the gift of like the phone and FaceTime and stuff like I'll spend the other day Barrett and I just did house chores together on ears for like four and a half hours oh my god and again (laughs) I realized that that is a I don't have human children in my house situation um that not everybody can do but like you just nurture it in different ways it doesn't always have to be you know snug on the couch together or or, you know even in the same time zone totally well and the other thing you said about new parents or parenting is like people who I feel like I had this time in my life a couple years ago when everybody it seemed like was having children and running into the mom friends phenomenon, like the literally the only thing you have in common with this person is that you have children the same age and now you have to be friends. You feel like you have to be friends with them and then you lose touch with the friends that you had before. And so you're not just friends with these people who are just like, I would never ever talk to you <laughs> if we didn't have children mm-hmm. the same age. And so like that, navigating like that too. And I also think it's so interesting you say that I was going to mention this earlier in the moment past, but I'm glad I, I got a chance to bring it back up. One of the things that I realized as, you know, I have this unique, this unique perspective because I don't have kids, but I exist in a childcare sphere, owning a, owning a childcare business, um, is that again, back to the assumptions, I've fallen into a bad habit of sometimes just not even including my friends with kids because I assume they can't come or I assume they will be too tired. And I think a lot of times parents take the shit for friendships falling apart. But I also think those of us without kids, we don't make the huge effort to make sure we call or set things up to be after bedtime or before bedtime or not during a nap time or, you know, like I think it it does go both ways. And I think that that's a lot of the reason that falls apart. You know, those friendships sort of separate and drift a little bit. Um, and I'm actually starting to figure out a way to incorporate that with the business, but like, that's another day. Um, but I do think that that's, you're totally right. The mom friend thing is like, I don't even know your name. I just know your kid's name and that your kid's backpack is red and blue with Paw Patrol on it. Like they don't even know each other very well. I love that you're talking about this, Tori. And it really, this is like calling me on my shit because I definitely have struggled with friends that have kids that like I, especially like long-term friends where I knew them before they had kids. So we had a different relationship. And then I think, okay, well they had kids and I'm not relevant to them anymore. And so then like, it's like, I'm not like, why would I? And it's like, I think I blame it somewhat on them. And I think that you're right. I have to really turn the turn the lens back on myself and figure out like how am I showing up in this relationship and it's interesting because just this past fall I had a phone date with a friend who I had a long relationship with before she started having children and she was so vulnerable with me on the phone and she was saying like I get really lonely like she was like you think that you have you know and this is obviously her experience and I'm not saying it's everyone's experience with children but like she is, she has little, little kids right now. And she's like, I'm home all the time. And I'm just, I'm really lonely. And it's like, wow. It was like, she was trying to like extend this olive branch. Like, Hey, like, can we be in better contact? Yeah. And you nailed it too. I think when you said that we were different people before the kids were there. And I think it's just because our, our lives become so different and there's got to be a middle ground of they've chosen their choice and I've chosen my choice and where can we exist in the middle? Mm-hmm. Cause we fall into a habit of like, Oh, but the kids and this, and they get into a habit of like, Ugh, well, my friends just don't understand. No, they don't kid people. Regular people don't understand that. Like for the first four years, generally of a child's life, the hours between usually one and three are just completely off limits. So there are these things, but we don't again, again, 
comes back to communication, what we need and how we ask for it. If one of your girlfriends has a baby, but the rest of you don't, you can say, girl, we don't know how to talk to you about this. We don't know how to help. Do you want food? Do you want us to just sit here with you? Do you want us to stay the hell out of here? What do you want? Um, they might not know. Um, and those moms that are out there listening that want to hang out with their other girlfriends, go to them and say, when can you go? I'll plan around it. Like just, you just gotta, you gotta figure it out. And that's the the, the best example I can think of. Totally. But, and it all comes back to communication. Well, and being creative, like you're not going to go out raging with that person. I just, I have a memory of like folding baby clothes laundry with a friend. And she was like, my house is disgusting and a mess and I can't believe I'm having you over. And it was just like, I just want to hang out with you. And I want you to know, I still love you. And that you still, this person you were before this tiny human is still in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And we're going to hang out and have a dumb conversation and we're going to fold your laundry because it's yep. the thing we all hate to do. Like, I think also it goes back to Katie, your friends who were like, actually you can't stay. Like having the grace to be like, actually what I need right now is like somebody to bottled body double with me and like get some shit done in my house. That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. It's so honest. Yeah. It's what it comes down to. And I really think that that's one of the reasons why when you, you know, the longer a friendship goes on, typically I would, I would wager to think that honesty is sort of at some center of it. Like at, at some piece of it, if it's a true genuine thing, cause you just, the friendships aren't going to last if the honesty isn't there. I don't yeah. have the energy or patience to stick around and bullshit this. If I can't show up and say, I didn't take my Lexpro for a couple of days. I completely forgot. And I'm an absolute fucking stick of dynamite right now. So like, just tread carefully. It's just too many spoons. That's real. Like <laughs> yes so real so real yeah. yeah it's so real okay this is like i feel like i could talk to you tori for like a hundred more years <laughs> like this is i can do this i can't believe Always. It's how long has it been it's been at least an hour already right yeah it smokes <laughs> that's amazing i don't know I'll how just that come happened. back yeah i know well you're gonna come okay. back we're gonna talk about it we have okay, so many right. things to talk to you about. Yeah. So many things. So many um, well, things. I just love being able to call y'all my Galentines. This is just <laughs> lovely. I am very excited about Valentine's Day this year because I'm doing some fun stuff with work and with my team and just trying to celebrate sort of love in general instead of the the hallmark of it all. And I love the that this has become a little tradition of February. Um, love it. And I just love you guys so much. Thank you for having me again. Thank you so much, Tori. It's so nice to see you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye. Where do I press the record? Bye.